I want to dive straight in and let's start with the problem that we face. This is the big dilemma. What you see here is a chart that shows on the vertical axis the ecological footprint of the countries of the world, and all the countries below this red line are living within the capacity of one Earth. On the horizontal axis, we have the Human Development Index of the United Nations, and all the countries to the right of the vertical red line are countries with high human development, such as Denmark. And you can see the problem. The area that we're aiming for, the sustainable development box, is empty. So here's our problem. We've figured out how to do human development, but not without sacrificing the planet. So how do we move developing countries across without moving them up? And more importantly, how do we move developed countries down in their environmental impacts without them believing that they're giving up their quality of life? So that's the dilemma that we face, and that's the sense in which I'm going to make the case to you that CSR is actually failing to change this picture. Well, how has business responded to this? We can see that uh, businesses are in different stages of maturity. So they're either at a defensive stage, or they're looking just for charitable approaches, or promotional, or even strategic approaches to corporate social responsibility. All of these four stages are what I call CSR 1.0, in the sense that they're the same approaches that we've seen more of of the last 20 years that haven't changed that picture of fundamental unsustainability that I've just shown you. And what I'm asking for is that we pay far more attention to a transformative approach to CSR that I call CSR 2.0. So let's dig into what each of these are. Defensive is what happens when you focus as a business purely on the financial figures and the economic growth. At the extreme, we have companies like Enron and uh, WorldCom and Lehman Brothers that actually went bankrupt as a result. Lehman Brothers, though, Enron, they had CSR programs, but they were defensive. They were all about keeping the regulators off their back, maybe keeping their employees happy, but really a risk-based approach that didn't fundamentally change the culture of greed that was in the organization. The second approach that we see a lot of uh, around the world is the charitable approach. This is all about philanthropy. It's a little bit like the cartoon suggests. Uh, giving something back to the community is a fine idea. Just make sure you take a lot more out first. Yeah, so it's, it's suggesting that it doesn't matter how we make our money, so long as we're very generous with it at the end of our careers. And there's something fundamentally problematic with that. The third approach, then, is the promotional approach in an age of marketing. This is all about the idea of greenwash. So, as the cartoon suggests here, you're a very polluting company. What do you do? You get the media in, and you talk to them about your paper recycling program in the office. Okay, it doesn't add up. It's where we get into the whole area of sustainability reporting. Not a bad thing of itself, but if it's just about promotion, then it isn't fundamentally changing the organization. And all the surveys that you look at when you ask CEOs around the world, why do they do CSR? The biggest response is that they do it for reputation and brand. So you know where most CSR uh, uh, is positioned in their agenda. At its worst, you get a company like BP deciding to change their logo to Beyond Petroleum, which of course is a joke, right? Because they've never gone beyond petroleum. The most they've ever invested in renewables is 4%, and that's been going down year on year. That's besides things like the Gulf of Mexico spill. So then we get uh, slightly more advanced companies that take a strategic approach. What do we mean by this? This is the likes of Coca-Cola, getting into trouble in the district of Kerala, uh, and being accused of stealing the water supply. Well, it wasn't strictly true, but it didn't matter. That was the perception. So Coke decides that their strategic CSR issue is water and begins investing a huge amount of money in their own water management and in the water capacity of their communities. 
So all they've done is align the CSR issue with their strategy. They haven't changed their strategy. They still sell sugared water as a business. Uh, this is where we get into the area of codes and standards, of which there are hundreds now on CSR, and they tend to create a tick box approach to managing these issues. How is transformative different? Let's take the case of Patagonia. What did their CEO do differently? Firstly, he stepped off of the growth treadmill. He said, we don't have to grow at double figures every year. Maybe we should be the best company in the world, not the biggest. Secondly, he decided, after doing a life cycle impact, to go 100% organic cotton, not to offer customers the option of organic cotton. And he transformed the industry as a result. Thirdly, when he commissioned his sustainability report, he got presented it at the board level, and he took one look at it and he said, in his words, if you'll excuse the language, this is bullshit. This does not tell the true story of our impact as a company. And instead, he designed something called the, the Footprint Chronicles, which take a life cycle impact at a product level, and when you're a consumer, you can tell how much for this pair of organic genes did uh, we emit in carbon, use in water, create in waste, how far did it travel to get to me? So these are some of the things we're seeing that are different. Why is the old approach failing? There are three reasons. The first is that it tends to be incremental, slow, stepwise, change. This is the typical quality management approach, plan, do, check, act, continuous improvement. But the issue is who sets the goals and targets? Of course, it's management. So they can be as ambitious or as unambitious as they like. And so although we're seeing change, it's nowhere near the scale or the urgency of the problems. The second uh, issue we have, and here I pick on the tobacco industry as an easy target, but CSR tends to be peripheral. It sits on the side. I love these old adverts, blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> I'm wondering if that still works. I've been meaning to test it. More doctors smoke camel. Well, we don't need to pick on the tobacco industry. In most companies, most industries, CSR sits on the side. It sits in a PR department, maybe in a corporate affairs or an HR department. Even if it has its own department, what that tells you is that it's not integrated into every function of the organization. It is also tends to be limited to all the big branded companies. So what about the hundreds of millions of small and medium-sized enterprises? Where is their CSR? We don't talk about that. So CSR has tended to remain peripheral. The third problem then, and this is not a popular thing to say at a conference that says who cares wins, but CSR tends to be uneconomic. We like to tell ourselves all the time that CSR pays that there's a business case. And that is true, you can find a business case in certain instances. But if we step back and we look at the market, does the market consistently reward sustainable and responsible companies? The answer is, hmm, sometimes. Um, but actually, if we look at the Vice Fund as an example, this is a US uh, investment fund that will only invest in so-called sin industries, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, military equipment. And you can see from the graph, it completely outperforms the market. So the message is, if you want to make lots of money, if you really want to win, then invest in the least sustainable and least responsible companies. So at the moment, the price mechanisms are still wrong in the market. Why are we paying more for fair trade, more for organic? These are issues that I think we really need to look at if we want these things to go to scale. So why CSR 1.0 and 2.0? Well, 1.0, of course, with the web, didn't go to scale yet. It was all about one-way communication. The same with uh, CSR in its first incarnation. CSR 2.0 is different in the same way that Web 2.0 is different. It needs to go to scale. It needs to become about interactive content, user-generated wikis and blogs and tweets. Uh, it really needs to be something where we co-create the solutions. Uh, and one of the real case studies here, of course, is Ray Anderson and Interface Floor, the carpet company. How would we know then if a company is 1.0 or 2.0? There are five principles which I'm going to talk through using some examples. 
So the first principle then, creativity, can be something as simple as innovation, investments. This is Warren Buffett investing in a company called BYD, an electric car company in China. And it can be something a little more unconventional. This is cabbages and condoms. If anyone has been to visit this restaurant in Bangkok, very innovative. The whole restaurant is uh, decorated with condoms. And the idea is to educate people and to take away the taboo that is around talking about safe sex and HIV and AIDS. And the founder uses the profits from that restaurant to fund a charity uh, which works on population development. He also became a minister. In fact, Thailand's fertility rate has dropped from 3.5 to 1.5 over the last few decades. It's a real success story. Another entrepreneur, this is uh, Anurag Gupta from A Little World, an Indian company that uses high technology, a mobile phone and a biometric scanner to create micro-banks in the rural villages. And what is a micro-bank? It's one woman sitting at her kitchen table. Uh, somebody comes to her and asks for a bank account. They don't need to be able to read or write. They don't need any p uh, papers, any proof of address. They just speak into the mobile phone. That's their, uh, their, their voice imprint. They take their fingerprints, and two days later, they've got a bank account. That phone holds 50,000 records for 20 years. So this is the kind of innovation we need. The second principle, then, is scalability. Like when Walmart decided not to offer uh, a choice to customers of whether they want organic products, but all of their cotton products went organic. We call this choice editing. All of their fish products became certified Marine Stewardship Council sustainable. We look at incandescent light bulbs and the compact fluorescence. General Electric was one of the pioneers in bringing this to scale. And then, of course, you need governments to step in. The EU now has banned incandescent light bulbs. And then you get innovations that have the potential to go to scale, like this one. Indigo is a, 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 a low-cost... Uh, solar technology, where they basically print solar panels onto sheets of plastic uh, for sale, using a top-up pay-as-you-go uh, system like you have with mobile phones, so that in places like Africa, you can actually power your light, power your, uh, your phone uh, using solar technology. The third principle, then, is responsiveness. Can we really make our business about responding to social concerns? And uh, Unilever, with their sustainable living plan, saying that they're going to double in size, halve their environmental impact, and take a billion people out of poverty through their products. That's the kind of responsiveness we need. GlaxoSmithKline having an open source uh, commons where they share some of their patents for uh, ne neglected tropical diseases. Um, we all know, of course, the WTO, the World Toilet Organization. This is started by a Singaporean entrepreneur to bring, using small businesses, to bring low-cost, low-water toilets to those who need it, the 2.6 billion people who still don't have access to adequate sanitation. The third way we test is through locality, uh, being global but also local. SC Johnson having to reformulate their products in Kenya because their cleaning products didn't work in the communal toilets on mud floors and walls. That's talking about getting local. Uh, Tom's shoes, very good marketing approach. You buy a pair of shoes, Argentinian design. For every pair you buy, one goes for free to somebody who needs it, who doesn't have shoes somewhere in the world. It's talking about a global problem of poverty and people not having shoes with a local solution through their business model. BHP Bulletin got rated on an international CSR index, came out very poorly. Why? Because the international index was very much uh, caring about uh, climate change, about energy efficiency, and actually what BHP Bulletin was uh, worrying about was malaria, because half their uh, workers were dying of malaria. They had a very effective malaria prevention program, but it was local and not global, and so in future companies have to get both of these things right. Final principle, then, circularity. Uh, obviously, closing the loop on the, on the production system. Uh, in Europe, we throw away our mobile phones after nine months. So unless we close that loop, we're not going to have a sustainable system. This is Phoneback, one of the companies who does that. Fuji Xerox, now in Asia, with plants in Thailand, in Japan, and in Indonesia, 
is reaching 98.5% zero waste to landfill. So nearly there on the zero waste. It is possible. Puma now starting to work out the environmental costs of their environmental impacts through their environmental profit and loss account. So what do you do tomorrow? You wake up and say, I want to be CSR 2.0. What's the first steps? You start by reassessing. This is all about impact. Life cycle impact assessment at a product level so that you can measure the footprint of your organization and your products. Second is about realigning. Who are you in partnership with? Are you only speaking to people who agree with you? Or do you have a challenging NGO on your board that is really making you think? The third then is to redefine. We need those visionary leaders who are going to set an ambitious agenda, whether it's zero waste or in the case of inter interface, zero impact. Uh, these are the kinds of goals we need if we're going to get to sustainability. The fourth is to redesign. We really are at a stage where we need the innovation to kick in on the products and service so that it becomes the easiest thing in the world to be sustainable. And the last one, the most difficult, is to restructure. How do we change the rules of the game, particularly the policy environment, so that it is fundamentally rewarding companies for being sustainable and punishing companies that are not. So we're talking about positive lobbying here to get true transformation. So I end with a cartoon. Uh, one of you here at the conference puts up your hand and says, yes, but what if it's a big hoax, like a joke, and we create a better world for nothing? Why would we want to do that? Of course, that doesn't make sense. We're all here because we're trying to create a better world. What I hope in the short time I've been able to show you is that currently our approaches are not working. Let's be honest with ourselves and let's find a transformative approach so that in 20 years' time, we're not going to have more CSR and bigger problems. So when history judges, all of you sitting in this room, you'll be able to say, I was part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you.